Hey everyone, welcome back to the Highlander Hardwater Outdoor Podcast. This is Matt, and we are back for another great podcast. Uh, this one, we're talking to Sean and Molly Busby. Uh, they talk about living off the grid in northwest Montana in a yurt that is run off of solar power. They're moving up to a new place in Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula. They talk about their nonprofit, Riding on Insulin, which empowers kids and teens with type 1 diabetes through shared experience and action sports like ski and snowboard camps. Sean talks about his type 1 diabetes and how that factors in their off-grid lifestyle. Molly talks about starting her own business, Yoga Hive Studios, and having a small town yoga studio business model. They both talk about how they started living off the grid and what went into it. Uh, Zach, I know that you uh, uh, listened to it as well. Uh, what did you think? Uh, well, one of the things that I found the most interesting, and I would encourage you all to listen for as well, is how they were able to build communities within all of their different areas of life and their different passions. Uh, so they were talking about building communities within living off the grid as well as action sports and even the yoga community and building small businesses within small towns. And in all those areas, they were able to build both online and offline communities of people that seemed to be really strong. And they were all able to encourage and uh, just be alongside each other, whether it's um, an activity or something they're going through. And I found that to be really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so everyone enjoy this conversation with Sean and Molly Busby. Uh, keep an eye out for some more episodes of the Highland and Highwater Outdoor Podcast coming soon. And also, if you like the podcast, uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes um, and make sure that you leave a rating and a review. Uh, that really helps get our podcast out there. And uh, we hope that uh, everyone enjoys. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Today we are joined by Sean and Molly Busby. Sean and Molly are entrepreneurs, yurt living experts, travelers, small business owners, and also have appeared on TV and YouTube featuring their, featuring their yurt life and tiny house. You can find them at www.thebusbyhive.com and on Instagram at Sean Busby and at Molly of the North, M-O-L-L-I-E-O-F-T-H-E. N-O-R-T-H, Molly of the North. Uh, so we want to welcome Sean and Molly, Outdoor Podcast. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, hey, Molly. I didn't, I didn't actually know that you were there, too. Awesome. I'm here. I'm just hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, yeah, we, we had a minute there just to kind of, you know, before the, the podcast, kind of talk about what you guys go, have going on. If you wouldn't mind, like, uh, just taking a second here, maybe... Uh, letting everyone else in on what's going on with you guys. I, I know a lot of people probably have, you know, heard bits and pieces through social media, but uh, maybe you want to just kind of bring them up to speed with what you got going on here. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, Molly and I, um, we live off the grid um, and we've been living here in uh, Northwest Montana for a couple of years. Uh, when we first got here, we uh, built a yurt uh, that's run off solar power um, and we haul up our own water in the winter we have to snowmobile in and out uh, we heat with uh, wood stove and uh, tell them what's, what, what's going on next oh well what's going on next uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I became an Alaskan resident and uh, we are currently moving up to our new homestead up in Alaska down on the Kenai Peninsula we have, have um, a property out there that's at the head of Kachemak Bay that overlooks uh, amazing glaciers and it is just surrounded by thousands upon thousands of acres of uh, state and protective native wilderness land. So i um, really excited about that. I'm getting ready right now uh, to get up, uh, drive up the Alaskan Highway and start moving our stuff there and uh, start that, that kind of new life in the last frontier. Man, that sounds uh, incredible. I'm still a Montana resident, in case you're wondering. I'll <laughs> probably stay one. They, but, they, um, they didn't accept your uh, your bid for like third yeah, rock no, on the right. <laughs> they turned me down. They were like, "You can come, but not you." Um, 
So no, I'm I'm gonna be a Montana resident, and um, we're definitely we're splitting time. I think overall, Sean will definitely spend more time in Alaska. Um, I've still got a lot of ties here, especially with um, the yoga studios that I own, and so um, yeah, we're just figuring it out. It's uh, and those are called Yoga Hive, like the Busby Hive, except okay. with yoga. Um, and we're just we're just figuring out you know where we wanna where we want to spend our days and our seasons and, and all that good stuff. So it's, it's definitely an exciting time. So my background is I'm a professional snowboarder and also the founder and now executive director of an international nonprofit that hosts the action sports camps for people living with type one diabetes. And, uh, so I'm planning on being in Alaska for at least eight months of the year. Um, kind of also as well as extending my personal snowboarding season, um, and uh, then during the bulk of the nonprofit season, due to having to travel and host camps uh, for kids and teens, I'll be primarily down in Montana so I can get around and, and fly to the different states to run our camps. And uh, but um, another thing that I that kind of triggered this move is we've been talking about Alaska for many years. And um, ever since we started living off the grid, it's just kind of been that next stepping stone. Uh, I've lived it. I grew up in Southern California before I, before I went professional with snowboarding in high school, I was used to concrete backyards and really no <laughs> open wilderness. I wasn't able to take classes in school like 4-H or wood shop. So basically all the skill sets that I've been developing have been simply over the last matter of years, just by living this lifestyle. And I really appreciate wow. that. And that's something that I want to be able to teach uh, Molly's and my future children one day. I want them to have those sort of skill sets. That's so cool. That's that's awesome. Hey, um, backing up real quick, you, you mentioned riding on insulin um, in, in what you had going on there, and I, I figured it would probably be um, really good to spend just a little bit of time here kind of speaking towards uh, type 1 diabetes and maybe just kind of walking us through from like a very basic level, like type one versus type two and you know what does riding on insulin do for sure that's a great question so type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease uh type two diabetes which we commonly hear about in the media is definitely more prevalent uh, around the world and that is more kind of genetic or lifestyle oriented so going back to type one diabetes type one being an autoimmune disease what that means is that when your body or when you become sick uh, or sick with a virus, your body sends out T cells to attack that virus and get that foreign virus out of your body and make you feel better. With type one diabetes, like any other autoimmune disease, your body be simply becomes confused. And so uh, the, body's, the body has an organ called the pancreas, which produces insulin. And insulin, what that does is that is produced whenever you eat food and the food breaks down uh, the carbohydrates and the insulin goes and grabs onto those carbohydrates and helps bring uh, that fuel into your cells and allows your body to use that fuel property. With type one diabetes, the autoimmune process basically sees that organ, the pancreas, as a foreign body part and says, oh, we need to get this out of the body. So what it does is it sends T cells to go and attack the pancreas as if it's a bad virus. And what that essentially does is destroys the insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas and thus a type one no longer is able to produce insulin. So they must take it via an insulin injection or from an insulin pump and insulin is needed for survival. So without it, a, a person with type one would, would die. And wow. so that's the main difference between type one, type two is type one is an autoimmune disease. The person that got it did nothing, nothing to themselves to get it. Mm -hmm. It's simply, it's basically like you're born with it. And, right. uh, and then type two, again, 80% of the time it's, it's lifestyle choices. Um, and that's, it's essentially a completely different disease. So our programs focus on type one diabetes and, uh, we serve about 500 kids and teens each year with our program. So we focus on uh, action sports. We do skiing and snowboarding. We do mountain biking. We just did a river rafting camp in uh, North Carolina. And we also have a race team. And the race team is we have people and families of all ages 
they go around and they fundraise for riding on insulin and they compete in either like a 5k, a half a marathon or an Ironman. And what they do helps raise money for, to get ki more kids to be able to come to camp. And so I started it after I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Usually you're diagnosed as a child. I was diagnosed when I was 19 in the heart of my professional snowboarding career. And I wanted to find a way that I could give back to the community. I saw that when I was going through this diagnosis and learning how to be, to still be a professional athlete um, with a, a, essentially a new body, I, I was able to, to research online and, and hear, just read a bunch of stories of kids that have lived with the disease and have known life no different. And I realized how fortunate I was being 19 years old, living free of it and getting to travel the world for snowboarding. So again, just wanted to find that community aspect that I could give back to. And that's where I was like, well, skiing and snowboarding is my passion. So why not use the tools and tricks that I learned on how to maintain myself as a professional snowboarder with type one diabetes and use that to give back to kids and teens. Right. And what I ended up finding out was that just having a community of others that are going through the exact same process that I was going through turned out to be the next best medicine, the insulin. It was just like this whole like kind of emotional support to it. And I just saw the importance of that for what that meant as far as managing the disease um, in my in my future, just how well I'd be able to do with it if I was happy to deal with it and not right. upset that I had it. Right. How, how does like high altitude affect someone with type one versus someone without type one? Like, are there a lot of adjustments that a person with type one diabetes has to make like in, like in pursuit of their physical activities, or is it just, you know, take your insulin business as usual? Oh, for sure. There is a ton that goes into it. It's a constant balancing act. And it's like being on a teeter totter. And every time you eat something or every time you exercise that adds like an extra weight to the other side of the teeter totter. And you just always want to keep it balanced. So altitude, humidity, climate, they all play a role as well as exercise. So like if I give, if I have a normal amount of insulin going into me from my insulin pump, then the way that will impact me if I go and let's say all of a sudden I go on a, on a big climb to go summit a peak and then snowboard down it, I may have to reduce the amount of insulin I'm getting. Otherwise, I'll, I'll have a severe hypoglycemia uh, or low blood sugar event that could send me into like a seizure um, or uh, a coma or it could even be deadly. So it's just constant balance. And when you're dealing with this with like a, a seven month old child or a two year old, a five year old, whatever age, I mean, we're always learning. We're always balancing. Um, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, our pancreas is broken. So it's, it's kind of crazy to think about that. We deal, if you have type one diabetes, you deal with one of the most deadly drugs where a simple overdose could essentially kill you. Wow. And, um, you're always just having to count carbs and just figure out those balances. And then as well as looking ahead, as far as what your day is going to be, if you're going to be doing a lot of physical activity, if you need to reduce the amount of insulin or if you need to eat more carbs. So yeah, that, it, it adds a component with anything, altitude, any of that. And uh, so even kind of like the off-grid lifestyle, just the extra activities that you have to, to do to just keep up with just, you know, do it like hauling water or, or whatever it may be, that, that also plays a role in just how I have to manage my disease too. Right. So with the insulin, is it, I mean, I guess where you guys are, are moving now and, and with the lifestyle, is there a hospital nearby? Like what, what is the, what's the plan, um, you know, to be able to keep the insulin and to, you know, what do you do in case of an emergency? Yeah. So, I mean, luckily I've done so many of my expeditions. I've been down to, I've been on all seven continents, the backcountry snowboard. I've been down to Antarctica twice. So, I mean, I've been able to manage my disease in those kind of remote environments uh, throughout Antarctica and, and the Arctic. And uh, so if anything was to go wrong, I might as well be on the moon. But I think just simple things like having access to a satellite phone, we were able to work with the county up on the uh, Kenai Peninsula or the borough up in the Kenai Peninsula to get us like a, an emergency 911 address. Now, 911 can't get into our property, but a helicopter can. So like there's all those sorts of things. The nearest hospital would be in the closest major town which would be um, Homer. 
and Homer's about 35 minutes away. Okay. So it's, I mean, we're, we're in the bush, we're, we're off the road, um, but we're still about three miles uh, or under three miles to the road with an ATV or snow machine access. So as long as those machines work, then we can get to the road, get to a car, meet an ambulance or anything like that. Gotcha. And talking about riding on insulin, how long uh, has that been active? How long have, have you uh, run that? Geez, so I, uh, let's see, I was diagnosed in 2004, and within that first winter, I, I launched, kind of just started doing my first camps. I would call up children's hospitals or organizations and uh, just tell them kind of my story and uh, ask to volunteer my, my services, and that's kind of how it formed. So basically, since 2004, but we became an official nonprofit in, let's see, that was 2010. So, um, yeah, we're, we're about eight years since official registered nonprofit organization. And, uh, but if you look beyond how long the mission's been going, it's been going since my diagnosis since 2004. Gotcha. And Molly, how, uh, with the, the yoga hive, does that kind of tie into, uh, writing on insulin or is that, a is that a completely separate passion that you, that you have? Well, it's that, so uh, I think everything ties in, but really <laughs> yoga, um, for me, so I um, served as the executive director of Riding on Insulin for um, seven years, up until last um, September. And so at that point, um, yoga really has been kind of this constant for me ever since I met Sean, not because he does yoga, he doesn't do yoga really, <laughs> um, but because when I moved out west um, to follow Sean, uh, I, I needed to make friends and I was trying to make friends with this one girl and she, all she wanted to do was go to yoga. And I had actually taken a class one time um, back in Wisconsin and I had vowed never to do it again because it was an awful experience. And I was like, oh, I gotta make friends. Like, you know, I really wanna be with this guy, but I gotta meet some girls. And so anyway, I started going to yoga and I fell in love with it. And, you know, Brittany, this girl, she's still one of my best friends. And she um, opened a yoga studio, I think four years ago um, in Lakewood, Colorado. And I kind of saw her as I was running, riding on insulin. I obviously was like really up to date on what she was doing and how she was giving back to her community in this beautiful way with yoga. And then the opportunity came up in Whitefish um, here in Montana for me to um, open my own yoga studio. And so it really, it, it was a side hustle completely. Um, I mean, <laughs> riding on insulin like was my full-time job until last year. Um, and I, I truly believe um, in small business and also really smart small business for small towns. Um, right. I've lived in small towns my entire life and I've seen, you know, both my parents are entrepreneurs and business owners. And so I've seen a lot of small businesses fail. I mean, most small businesses fail within the first three years. So um, I wanted to put together like a really smart business plan and model um, for, and this is what I'm currently working on with Yoga Hive Studios is my having a small town yoga studio business model. Um, right now it's not a, it's not a franchise. It's more like a licensing agreement where um, we, work with small town studio owners, yoga hive owners, um, to, to be smart, uh, because I truly believe just like Sean wanted to give back to the type one diabetes community, which certainly I do too. It's part of my life of course, but my passion is giving back to these small towns and making sure that they have a sustainable yoga studio, because I believe it should be everywhere. And I believe everybody should have access to it. And it just, I believe yoga can heal, heal the world. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, that's my big, big bottom line. Right. So um, really in, in September, part of the reason for me stepping back was, um, and I'm, you know, I'm still working part-time with riding on insulin. It's, um, it's such a fulfilling job. I love, I love the camps. I love the kids and all of that, but um, I wanted to give more of my energy to Yoga Hive um, just so that I can grow that now. So Sean's, Sean's got the reins of riding on insulin. I've got the reins of Yoga Hive and we both, you know, support each other and kind of work toward the the common mission, um, which really is just creating community. Right. That's the theme on everything. And even with the Busby Hive, we want to create a community of people that um, share this off-grid lifestyle or share the yurt lifestyle or tiny house or, living or tiny cabins and, and all this stuff. It's, it's a really- sustainability. Yeah, sustainability overall. And it's just, you know, like Sean said, you know, the next best medicine to insulin or to 
um, to insulin is having a community. That's what he says right. for riding on insulin. And I think that's true for anybody is like getting through anything you're going in through in life. Like you have to have your community. So I would say another, another component that also led to the, the, yo the yoga component um, as far as opening up yoga hives was that when Molly was full time with riding on insulin, you know, we've been wanting to have start a family and we were traveling so much that it was literally impossible. And we we're like, if we're going to put riding on insulin into onto a sustainable path, someone needs to someone needs to back off. And the person that that was best suited for was Molly, because she could then be home more. She could be more locally focused on on her community, as well as, you know, helping the, to raise a child um, if I, I had to travel so much. So that was another right. route. So we can expect a uh, yoga hive in Homer, Alaska soon then? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, working on it. Very cool. So explain then, it, I know that you, you said that you started off started off in SoCal, and then w what was the transition? Because it seems like something happened in here where it was like all of a sudden, like you, you abandoned the old lifestyle and we went into a yurt. <laughs> So uh, yeah, <laughs> tell, tell me how in the world we ended up in a year. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Southern California. Like I went to school in elementary school in Laguna beach and we would like, we'd see the whales migrate during different times of the season when we we're out at recess by just staring out in the ocean. Wow. We had half days on Fridays and we'd go down to the beach and surf. And uh, so when I went professional with snowboarding, I was given the opportunity to go train up in Whistler, Canada. And so I jumped on that opportunity. That was in uh, my high school years, my later high school years. And then I, uh, once I graduated from high school, I relocated to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, where I continued my training and competing and snowboarding. And then that's when I got diagnosed with type one. And I, I wanted to also understand that I wanted to get a college education. So I then relocated out to Utah so I could go to the University of Utah as well as still uh, train and compete up in Park City with the Park City snowboard team and and do all my stuff there, but then also get a college education within 30 minutes from where I trained. Right. And yeah, so then after being in Utah, when Molly and I got married, we were just like, you know, Utah wasn't for us. Uh, it just wasn't where we saw where we should raise a family. We wanted to go further north. Like there was this calling for me to just kind of get further and further away. Like the more I, tra what happened was the more I traveled and the more cultures I got to experience, the more I got to realize like the bubble world that I grew up in, in, in Orange County, California. And it really opened my eyes. And so Molly and I did this one expedition, this backcountry ski and sober expedition to the Canadian Yukon. And we stayed in this little tiny cabin. We had to take like a little jet sled with our um, with our water into it. It was a dry cabin, so we had to bring our water. We had to cook on top of a wood stove. And at night, uh, the cabin faced north, and you would just look from your bed. You could watch the northern lights. Wow. And it, it was, I mean, how big would you say that cabin was? It was... It was small, but I just also want to add, like, meanwhile, while Sean was in Bubble World, I actually spent like 12 to 15 summers of my life leading backpacking trips, canoeing trips, biking trips. Like I was outdoors like any and, and my friends from home were always like, why do you always leave home and go to camp? Like, what's up? And I was <laughs> like, get me out. Like I wanted to be outdoors. So for me, it was it was a little bit fresh again, like I'd been a couple years away from camp, but like. For me, it was just people are always like, oh, my God, I can't believe you live off the grid. And I'm like, actually, I can. Um, and so it's <laughs> it's definitely it was a natural transition for me. Um, and yeah, like Sean said, that trip to the Yukon really was like it was the, the first time we did that together. Yeah. The, and I mean, I've been doing expeditions in Antarctica and Iceland and, and that sort of stuff. So um, but then to, to be there with Molly and then just be able to spend that time, that quality time with each other and then just talk about it and be like man, we really look how happy we are. And we have nothing here. Like right. there's, we can't, there's, we have nothing. It's just a tiny little cabin. And, uh, so that really was like the turning point where things started kind of turning in our head. And then we went on an expedition to, um, Kyrgyzstan 
and we brought over ski gear and snowboard gear and taught kids how to ski and snowboard. We gave uh-huh. them the gear. We taught local village elders about avalanche safety. And we got to see yurts and like yurt makers and these people that their full time jobs are, are making yurts um, or gurs is what they're called out there. Hmm. And we love the round space. We love the connection that it felt to the ground. Uh, there's just something kind of spiritual about a round space, too, as well. No shop corners. And so go, coming off the tails of the Yukon and then going to Kyrgyzstan, that just kind of opened up our eyes a lot more to huh, well, maybe we should explore this. And then and then it was pretty magical. We bought this, we found this amazing property in Montana. Like our neighbors said, we probably got the best deal in the state of Montana when we bought it. <laughs> and um, we wanted to build something on, you know, the, there's a part of the property that has a better view. And we were like, well, let's build something. And then I was like, we don't know how to build. And then Sean was like, we need to build a yurt. And you know, for a minute we were like, let's bring one over from Kyrgyzstan. But then looking at like shipping and the impact of bringing it all the way over, we were like, well, let's see if we can find a local one. Right. And I'm not even joking. Like the day Sean decided to search locally for a yurt, he pulls up this woman 15 miles from us, has this Shelter Designs yurt. Shelter Designs is a Montana um, yurt company. And it's the company that we wanted to get a yurt from anyway. And literally 15 <laughs> miles from us. And Sean was like, dude, here's a yurt. And it's, you know, she was discounting it because she'd only been living in it for two years, but it was a smoking deal, 30 foot yurt with a loft. And so we bought it, for, like we went over there and gave her money. We're like, we're buying this. <laughs> and we spent a couple months in our spare time just going over there and helping her disassemble it. That was part of the deal. Um, but what it allowed us to do is see where every single piece goes, every single piece, the way she had this laid out, um, so that we could take it down and we could feel really confident. And then, and then we realized we were setting it back up again. I mean, shelter designs, they send you a DVD if they can't come help you themselves. And it's literally like we had to like charge a computer on the generator so that we could play the DVD and like, we'd play a little bit, and they'd be like, do this. And then we'd go and do it. And then so we'd go back like to the So it's like Ikea for a year? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 They make it so easy. And then we were like, it, in a day and a half, the yurt was dried in. And yeah. I think you can do it wow. in a day if you're really hustling. Um, we just did it in a day and a half. But, like, it was such a cool experience. And then we kind of caught the bug. Like, Sean, um, we have our good friends. Like, you remember I talked about Brittany and her husband, Russ, our friends from um, when we were living in Utah. They've built a straw bale home they um russ flips cars and does vegetable oil stuff and like sean has learned so much from him and like he came out and showed us how to make our own plywood flooring and like just all the friends that we have had in our community and like the stuff that they've showed us and like and then the community that we've built online too um it's just it's been a a really cool experience knowing that like it's not rocket science it's right. it's really not that hard. How, yeah. how much of the process was actually um, covered on that H- on the HGTV episode? Uh, None. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. So we were we were on um, HGTV House Hunters Off Grid. Right. So that basically um, was the process of us finding the property, but they didn't, you know, film us building the yurt at all. Um, the H or the DIY network um, building off grid that was when we built our tiny cabin and that was like filming the entire process. So we have the only um, documentation of building the yard that that we have is on our website. And because we, we did a pretty good job at blogging through the process. Right. Uh, I I remember the uh, HGTV episode and I think I remember my, it's been a while, but I think I remember in that episode when you guys picked out the, I think it was the house that you were looking for. You saw like that piece of land and you're like, Oh, we're going to do something with that. And then yeah. Yeah. The, I and remember because we had already met when I watched that. And I was like, oh, I know what they do with that. <laughs> but it was yeah. cool, like, looking back and seeing the evolution, kind of like, you know, how you guys, you know, went from one place to the house and then from a house to, like, a yurt kind of, like, on the property and, you know, yeah. now, now to Alaska. That's very cool. Yeah. 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 It's all been stepping stones. Um, the, the, the last large stepping stone that we had was when the, the DIY network reached out to us. Um, a little over a year ago, and that was, hey, we remember hearing on HGTV that you were debating about building a tiny house. Would you guys be interested in doing that? It was two years ago. Or two years ago. And um, and we're like, yeah, we're thinking about doing that, um, but more of like a 
an off grid cabin, not necessarily a tiny house on like a, on a trailer. Um, and, uh, so the reason we were kind of looking at doing that was a couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with another autoimmune disease. It's a bad hobby to be into, <laughs> um, <laughs> called, uh, lupus. And, uh, oh, my lupus sister is, has that. Oh, really? Yeah. I, yeah I, I, she just got diagnosed. So we're actually just learning about it. So this will be very informative. Gotcha. Yeah. Lupus is, ex- is extremely rare in men. Um, about one in 10 people that have lupus are men. There's only 500,000 men in the world that have lupus. So um, it was suspected when I was 19, but the disease, it, it takes an average person about six years to get diagnosed because it, 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 it just masks itself as like MS or other similar diseases. So, so lupus is another autoimmune disease. Once you have one autoimmune disease, you have uh, a high likelihood of getting another one because there's something haywire going on in your body. Hmm. And um, so just kind of knowing the, some of the facts about uh, with lupus, it's different for everyone. Um, as far as one major person that's been in the media recently a lot with the disease is Selena Gomez. She had a kidney transplant because uh, hmm. um, uh, of her lupus. And so um, just kind of knowing the, some of the complications that the disease could bring, we wanted to create a, on our little homestead here, we wanted to create a sustainable uh, home that could function more with Molly running it in case I had to go on any sort of like light doses of chemotherapy to treat the disease or anything like that. So like when you have a hard winter that, you know, it can get negative thirties out here in Montana um, and we get a ton of snow. I just wanted to have a, a, a building that Molly could help out with that was easy to to utilize because right. living off the grid has its has its quirks and uh right um so we learned a lot from doing it with the yurt and we wanted to upgrade our systems majorly by doing it in the tiny cabin that we built by Mr. Heater, North America's most popular brand of portable heaters and accessories. Use coupon code PODCAST20 to receive 20% off and free shipping at www.mrheater.com. Just make sure I understand this. Maybe I missed it. The tiny cabin is what you're building in Alaska right now, right? No. no. So the tiny cabin yeah. is like right down the road from the yurt. It's on the same acreage. Oh, um, okay. And we built that. That's what we built for the DIY network um, two okay. years ago. So we built that. Um, people are always like, where do you live? And we're like, well, somewhere between the cabin and the yurt. Um, <laughs> so uh, we go back and forth. Like sometimes I'll, I'll lead yoga retreats um, and classes up in the yurt um, and the cabin you know, it takes less wood to heat it. So it's more economical to be down there. Um, but we love the earth. But anyway, um, the, the property that we have in Alaska, um, that we just got has a cabin on it. Um, a log cabin that the couple that we bought it from there, um, over 80 years old and they hand built this log cabin when they were 65. Um, they had to like drag in all of the logs in February in Alaska on like snowmobiles, like the 65 year old people. And they sat at, we sat at their kitchen table with a scrapbook and they showed us every wow. single picture from the process wow. of building it. Like it was, are, are those coolest. pictures online anywhere? <laughs> if people wanted to, not like, yet, check them not, out not or? yet. We're okay. definitely gonna, we have this whole, um, we've kind of been, since we built the tiny cabin, it was <laughs> That was, it was just so much work and stress um, that we kind of just took a year to like settle down. Um, and we, you know, we've been a little absent from a website and blogging, although Sean documents it on Instagram. Um, so now it's like, okay, we have a new story. We have, you know, a new adventure. So that's really going to be our focus on the website um, and just keeping people updated because it really is not a lot of information other than what you see online and on TV on living off the grid. But what you see on TV is literally like 3% of what it takes to right. really do it. Um, it's not like I was explaining to someone the other day, they were like, do you still like that? Do you still like living off the grid? And I'm like, actually, I think 
I've come to like it way more now because mm. I, you know, when we started, it's this, it's a really aggressive switch of a way that you live, like literally not being able to turn on the water and like wash your hands or wash well, dishes. You, you like, can, if you have a well, the problem with our property is to dig a well, it would be, it would cost over 30 grand. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. we chose, okay. we, how so we could yeah. have it, but yeah. we chose not to pay that money. So anyway, it, for me, it was a really aggressive switch. And, um, I think what I missed the whole time up until just recently was that you really have to create space in your day to appreciate it. Like if you don't mm. have time in this busy world that we live in to appreciate, you know, cutting, you know, chopping some wood for the fire in the night, I mean, it's just going to be annoying and it's just going to be aggravating to have to do those extra steps because right. of the way that we're taught to live now. And so I think what Sean has been really awesome at, you know, showing me is that we got to create space. Like if we keep filling up our day with meetings and, and trips and, and, and we love the trips, but like, you know, right. just everything, everything contributes. And, you know, especially with lupus um, and the impact that stress has on the body, like we literally, we can't, we can't live that life anymore. It can't be stressful. It needs to be peaceful and it needs to be, it needs to have space to appreciate everything that we built and everything that we have. And so that's, that's kind of been the theme over the last six months, um, just kind of clearing out anything that's overly stressful in our life and, um, which has been a struggle in and of itself, but you mm -hmm. know, we're seeing the other side now and things are a lot better. And so for like my space, um, it's just for me being connected, being out in nature. When when I was in uh, my early years of high school, my brother passed away. And so that's what drew me really into the mountains and drew me to just being in that nature, uh, just using my hands and, and, and that sort of stuff. So um, this is just kind of, it all feeds off of that. It's the way that I cope with living with an autoimmune disease living with the loss of friends um, or living with the loss of my brother. And um, it, it truly brings me, I mean, that's like the next other, the other medicine that I use to treat autoimmune diseases. And, uh, um, you know, when we built the cabin, we had never built a home. Uh, the year you can call it a home, whatever, it comes in a kit, but we had never built a home from scratch. And so when we did that DIY channel, we got, three months to learn how to build by we would basically watch YouTube videos, read and <laughs> look at Pinterest and get ideas. And we learned that That's first incredible. time home builders should not build a house in only three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we like literally after we finished it, I was like, I'm done. I'm done. No more. Like I, we need to just take a break because it was just, Oh my God. It was so intense. Molly said she'll never build again, but I, now she's talking about, well, what should we build in the last I one? I don't build a year. <laughs> I don't build another year. It's just, I mean, just, yeah. It, yeah. Three months is not enough time. So, but the systems that we have in there are absolutely incredible. You know, we have the, uh, the boss, the Mr. Heater shower, um, unit that goes into, a whisk an old age whiskey barrel that it goes <laughs> into a gray water system. We have a massive rainwater collection system that filters and pumps it to an outdoor solar heated shower that you can use in the summer, Very as cool. well as a wood fire, a cedar wood fired hot tub. We have a, <laughs> from, uh, um, it's a snorkel. Yeah. It's from snorkel. snorkel. And then, uh, we have oh, a, cool. um, uh, hot water siphon that is cir uh, circled around our stove pipe. So whenever we're running the stove all winter long, it's also making hot water for, cool. for cooking or tea or anything like that. So um, the systems that we did were just a lot more practical and we were able to kind of use more permaculture into that setup. And then we have, you know, chickens that are all around ducks and turkeys and they kind of go through and they till the property so that we can have a garden. And uh, yeah, so everything kind of just kind of incorporated into itself. So, so that's another component of like the off the grid living that, that we haven't really talked about, but so along with learning how to build a cabin, you also learned how to be a farmer and uh, take care of the animals. And then also like I've seen pictures, it looks like you're kind of, you're raising butchering kind of, doing everything on your own, right? Yeah, I mean, we're getting there. Um, we also, we, we go in with a share on, on meat and that with one of our neighbors. And um, and then of course, you know, you got hunting. Um, so right now, I'm, as I established my Alaskan residency, 
Um, eventually we'll be able to, or I will be able to hunt moose, fish, um, and kind of, kind of have a little more subsistence lifestyle, but we still, I mean, we still go to the grocery store, um, and get stuff that we need, um, especially in the winter because we're still learning all of that capacity. Right. We, um, we're not, we're not the best gardeners. Um, <laughs> that's one thing. We have a few things that we're really good at and we have a few things that we're really bad at. Yeah. <laughs> How's your hunting? Uh, it remains to be seen. <laughs> I'm really good at crafting, so I don't know why you're saying that. I'm, and I succeeded. You did. So um, there you go. <laughs> I have my ways. Right. But again, Southern California roots, so it's all learning. I love it because I, all my my friends that like all my friends that have grown up in Alaska and lived there all their lives, they're like so stoked to take me on moose hunts and and everything so and now just like with the move to alaska the only sad thing is that we're we're trying to find happy homes for our ducks and chickens and the the one turkey that we have so um that's the only really sad part we're gonna miss them you're you're not gonna move them up to alaska with you I don't know. We if can't. We can't take them across the border. Oh, <laughs> that makes sense. Just fly with them. <laughs> just fly with them. <laughs> I have put out calls to my friends that anyone that wants to come and have duck for dinner. <laughs> we, have, we have plenty on the Him property. And, like you're welcome to invite us over for that duck dinner. <laughs> so as we're talking about Alaska, uh, what are sort of the next steps then uh, currently uh, about you guys going up there? So I have some travel coming up, um, but then I am planning on, uh, I've already started making a pile on, in part of our cabin that is going to Alaska. So I'm gathering all of our, I got to hook it up to solar right now. The only light is the 24 hours of daylight. Um, so <laughs> come winter, um, we need some lights. So I have oil lamps and all that sort of stuff too, but I'm planning on hooking up some propane lights as well as I'm bringing over a bunch of solar stuff from Goal Zero. And we're gonna hook it up to solar panels and get some LED lights ran in there. And uh, and, and the reason he's packing this all up here is because um, shipping, shipping to Alaska is just a nightmare oh, and super expensive. And then trying to get to the properties. I mean, that's gonna be a whole other thing, especially because I'm going up by my, Molly, Molly can't join me until August and so it's just going to be me, three dogs, and an ATV trying to haul all of our stuff in on the gnarliest access trail ever. And if it rains, that... Yeah, hopefully it doesn't rain. Like, because if there's mud, I mean... The mud is absolutely ridiculous. It's unlike, I've, unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I We were there when the permafrost was, like, melting and, like, during breakup, and we'd be walking on the trail, and then all of a sudden the trail would just collapse to our shins, like almost to the bottom of our kneecaps and we'd just wow. be stuck. Like I didn't, I don't think I ever realized why Alaskans wear extra tufts. Um, those like tall, right. like, um, you know, like boat boots. I was yeah. like, oh yeah, they, you know, they're kind of, now nah, they're like a style statement, but I was like, okay, what's the practical use of these? And like, thank God we had them on because like literally the mud was, it was so deep. I was just, at the end of the day, you could just laugh because you're like, this is, this is ridiculous. This is outrageous. Um, so it's something we definitely don't but really it's, deal with. Yeah, anymore. it's it's all that. And then getting, I mean, getting Molly outfitted as well as myself for it, the predator scene out there is absolutely real. Yeah, I was going to ask um, you about that because you're at the Kenai, right? You're, you're right in grizzly country there. Some big yeah, ones. Yeah, right in grizzly country. I mean, and we're in grizzly country here in Montana. And we're, I mean, we put electric fencing around everything, like solar electric fencing. And Um, but yeah, there, because that access trail is so long and there's heavy alders and big alders, like things are just hiding. And like, actually what I'm more scared of than, than grizzly is, uh, is moose. Oh, just, um, just, we don't have really many moose where we are right now. And so like, I always hate being in moose country on like snowboard expeditions because I'm just like, ah, I don't know like how they're going to react, but um, so yeah, you know, it's like a have to pack a 44 Magnum and a, a Glock. So just as backup security, the bear spray, and that will be, Hey, we're going to get groceries. Are you, do you are you packing heat? So <laughs> Cause where you're at, you're basically 
I mean, you're like right across from uh, Kodiak, right? Like those are the largest yeah, Kodiak, bears on the planet. Yeah, Kodiak is is down on those those islands. But yeah, people that go to Kodiak, a lot of them, they leave out of the Kenai. Wow. Yeah, I've always wanted to get up there. It just looks beautiful. How are the black yeah, flies? Um, I've heard about them. I, no, I, they're no. not as bad as like in the interior. Uh, there's a, there's thankfully a bunch of wind where we are, oh, so that okay. keeps like the mosquitoes and the bugs down significantly. Is it actually warmer where you're where you're at in Alaska than it wasn't it was in Montana? Because you're you're right on yes. the bay there. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, so people are like, why would you go? I'm like, it's actually it's a lot warmer up there in the winter than here. Uh, you know, the average temperatures are like probably like teens and twenties. Uh, but it, it doesn't, I mean, they do have really cold days and their cold days do feel a lot colder cause it's, uh, there's more humidity in the air, right. but compared to Montana, man, Montana can get really cold. They, we get negative right. 50, negative 60 wind chills. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, but the other thing that is a major component of this move is with lupus, um, about 50 or 60% of people have something called photosensitivity where it's basically like being allergic to the sun and to heat. Hmm. Um, we know with my lupus that um, I come out of remission and my disease becomes super active and impacts my kidneys and makes me arthritic um, when uh, it's summer out here in Montana. It gets hmm. too hot. It's The UV uh, is a lot higher than it is in Alaska. And um, also th- the... Yeah, I mean, the heat, I, I just get these blistering rashes that are pretty debilitating. So, again, just trying to prevent having to go on, like, any sort of chemotherapy agents um, and get into an environment where the weather kind of cooperates with my disease is another major goal. And, th- and that location is is great for it. Very cool. Well, uh, we are really looking forward to maybe having you on the podcast again uh, in a couple months once you guys... Maybe not a couple months, but we'll wait for you to get settled a little bit more, and you can <laughs> tell us a little bit more about Alaska and how it's going. I mean, we're really excited to hear more about we, that. We got to let Molly get up there. Yeah, we got to let. Yeah, after August. <laughs> after August. August. Yeah. 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 No, we're we're excited, um, and it's just a new. Yeah, it's just a matter of weeks now till we start driving, or till yeah. I start driving. Yeah, you're uh, gonna drive. You and three dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and, awesome. and a massive trailer. Yeah. So I know we had a great time talking with you guys today, um, but yeah, can't but wait be- to, to follow up and, and see what's next for sure. But before we close it out, uh, definitely mention uh, a lot of the sponsors. And uh, I mean, I know on your website, uh, the Busby Hive, you have uh, some partners that you've worked with. Um, can you mention those and how much they've helped you? Yeah, totally. So um, Goal Zero, um, they, I've been working with them on snowboarding expeditions for many years. They provide uh, solar equipment, and so that's really great, obviously, for off-grid living. So Goal Zero for kind of uh, for providing us with our generators, our solar power generators, our solar panels, um, as well as snorkel hot tubs, um, Hollywood. They make a sustainable recycled furniture uh, furniture. Uh, Sun Dancer, they make um, all sorts of different uh, DC appliances, as well as you guys, Mr. Heater. Man, I can't stress how much you guys have saved us on so many <laughs> cold days with being able to fire up a Mr. Buddy. Uh, we always have multiple Mr. Buddies, uh, especially in some of our rooms on those really cold days. Um, I, we laughed the other day. We were talking to our other friends that live up in um, Polebridge, uh, where, um, and they said, we were laughing about outhouses, and they were like, Every outhouse deserves a Mr. Buddy. Yeah, our outhouse has a Mr. Buddy in it. Yeah. You know, we were going to have that as the motto, but <laughs> some, somebody <laughs> turned it down. So true. <laughs> um, and then 686, uh, they're a major supporter of Molly and I with our skiing and snowboarding. They're a uh, ski and snowboard uh, outerwear company, and they just they sent us on a lot of really cool expeditions and we're really, really thankful for them. And um, yeah, and then just a bunch of miscellaneous snowboard companies. But, you know, as far as the off-grid stuff, you guys rock it for sure. And we love it. So we love you guys. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, we, we could talk to you guys all day here. But uh, I think we'll get it wrapped <laughs> up for today. And um, we'll look forward to giving you guys a call back in a couple of months when uh, Molly of the North is up north. Exactly. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, sounds good. All right. <laughs> awesome, guys. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. the time to talk here. We really right. appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Thanks. Nice talking to you guys. Yeah, Take nice care. talking to you too. Talk to you right. later. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye.